Alex, uh, towards Andrew. So I'm wondering, like with OHL, it seems like the whole interpretation by lawyers seems to be a big issue, right? Like, it's usually something that always comes up like, yeah, it's like, I don't understand it that way, and lawyers probably see it entirely differently. And what about like the upwards and downwards paths in you? Like, do you, do you expect this like discussion free now, or do you expect people might start arguing like, no, this is not a, this is not a component. This is so. What degrees of freedom do you anticipate in this? It's it's a, and you know, by necessity something very sensible when it says that you know permissive licenses are much simpler to interpret and and it, it is also the sort of gap of expectation between the licensors and the licensees you know if you're licensing under a permissive license your expectation is basically that your code could end up anywhere so you're fine you're pretty you're pretty relaxed about what's going to happen to it. you might get you know excited about attributions and so on um, with any copyleft license you're going to have a much more significant problem because people's expectations um, are going to be different and part of the part of the issue that you have is that I mean one one thing that um, thank you very much um, you know one 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 thing that, that people kept on saying to us all all the well on the drafting process of the CERN H, uh, OHL is you know can't you just define when you say this is my project X and I'm going to use a particular variant of CERN OHL and this is what I want the scope to look like and that sounds very attractive that the that the licensor can make that definition but unfortunately what it means is that you end up with a whole bunch of slightly incompatible versions of exactly the same CERN OHL and it makes it very difficult to merge different projects if you want to combine the projects together so you've you've got in some cases a sort of slight creative ambiguity which has the, the sort of the disadvantage of making uh, uh, because, because we don't know I mean you know um, uh, I mean um, Sort of having Miriam and I have sat down and we've gone through a whole bunch of edge cases and we've had a you know a lot of really interesting input from other people saying but what if what if what if and we've tried to deal with all of those but you know that's going to be a minute percentage of all the potential what ifs out there so it's a balance between putting specific stuff in the license that says this is the shape of what's going to happen and then also developing a, a sort of body of FAQs that we we hope is is going to become a sort of consensus behind users of the of the license that will help to guide interpretation through the community norms that are developed. But also, you know, ultimately, you know, if unfortunately there is a court case, then that's something that the court will be able to say. Well, actually, the community's interpretation of this is is X. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there is there is no sort of you know clear answer, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, this is why Alex is perfectly understandably frustrated. Well, Lawyers won't give, right. <laughs> give him a specific answer to something. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Hello. You have to throw it. <laughs> now, does it work? <laughs> it's just a box. Okay, so we had the discussion of you just said, uh, well, there will always be a need for lawyers to interpret some things, and we had heard Alex before that says essentially giving a CLA can provide a project or a foundation or whatever one entity a essentially the way to decide what the ultimate truth is, what was meant by this license or by this license choice. Do you think this is the only way to avoid ambiguity or do you think there are ways to create draft licenses that avoid CLAs or avoid a lot of legal uncertainty that especially company lawyers don't want? Who wants to take this? I mean, I You're the lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't want to talk too much. Um, I, well, okay, I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a theory that, um, you know, in some ways, you, you, you've, got a, you've got a community that's got a, that's got a pretty good idea of where they want to see their code end up, how they would deal with particular um, edge cases. Um, and, uh, and then, so they sort of explain to a lawyer what they want. The lawyer tries to draft something, um, and then a problem arises, and then that something that the lawyer drafts sort of gets fed into this non-deterministic system called the judge, which comes out with different answer every time. I mean, it, it's a completely ludicrous system. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering if a point will come where the actual license test sort of withers away and you can actually define much more clearly as an engineer that you can sort of tick little boxes and say, I want this to happen, I don't want this to happen, I want this to happen. Um, and um, almost like a sort of more finely grained set of Creative Commons licenses. And this is, this is something that we very much sort of had in mind when we were drafting the different variants of CERN OHL. 
and then that can be you know, fed into the tool chain. The tool chain can work out what the legal dependencies are between these various things. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, it, it comes out with green, yeah, that's fine, or red, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, I mean, you know, possibly that's a mechanism that at some point in the future will arise. I don't know. So ultimately, you know, code becomes law at that stage. You know, if this particular algorithm says you can do this, then yeah, that's fine. If the algorithm says you can't do it, then it's not fine. It will produce weird outcomes, certainly. But at least they're outcomes that you can predict in advance because you can feed them into the filter and the answers will come out. And hopefully by that time, I will be long retired and the fact that I've just made, you know, my, my sort of <laughs> subsequent younger lawyers redundant um, is not going to be too much of a problem. Um, I don't think the CLA in itself is a, is a solution to that. Um, I mean, and, you know, in itself, you've got the certificate of origin mechanism and you've got a whole different range of different sorts of CLA. So that, that is really just the same problem, just uh, as between the developer and the project as opposed to between the project and users of the project. Um, and I can see that, you know, and the reason that the, there isn't a particular mechanism that is always used is simply because um, it, there isn't one proven to be the best method. I mean, there's a lot of logic, you know, using the, the uh, developer certificate of origin for Linux kernel development, for example, makes a lot of sense if you've got, you know, the, 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 the same license in, license out mechanism. Yeah, the, kind of a follow-up question on that is, what is the state of litigation at this point? Has SOLDERPAD, SIR, and OHL, have any of these seen any court time to have any defense? I know Apache's seen a lot of defense time, so um, have these others been tested at this point? I'm not aware of any open hardware licensing litigation at the moment. There's very little in the world of software, um, but I'm not, not aware of any, any open hardware licensing litigation. So I'm, I'm very happily, well, not happily proven wrong, but I'd like to know if I'm wrong. <laughs> There is a controversy um, regarding an extruder, a modification to an extruder uh, for 3D printing. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It was a controversy involving uh, the uh, RapRap community and uh, MakerBot, the company. And um, it was not, it didn't, it was not, um, there was not litigation involved, I think. But uh, there was uh, grounds, I think, for, uh, but I don't know the status of that. Yeah. But we should look into that controversy. Maybe there's something there. Well, this is a question a bit for everybody. Uh, so the question is, what's bad with copyleft? So I've been asking this question to a number of people, and everybody gives me a different answer. And I think you know the FOSS in particular, I think is particularly happy with more permissive licenses. Of course, you have a broad spectrum, but I think in general, the public likes more permissive. And so what's bad with copyleft? I'd like to know it from the audience. Of course, we have companies like Google who, you know, of course, like some openness to some point, but as they say themselves, they, at some point, they would like some secretive uh, parts. So that's obviously a no-go for copyleft. What are the other arguments against copyleft in hardware? I'd like to hear it from you. This one, somebody else. Alex. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, for, I, I, I like copyleft. So, the, um, so the issues I have in the software, the software world have been that sometimes it can lead to incompatibilities, which prevent people from um, using my code when I would like them to be able to do so, such as the issues that people have had with GPLv2 only in Apache. Um, also, issues in terms of understanding, education, and you know, I think that. Often there are cases where, I think it comes down to attitude and what you're trying to achieve, really. So for some people, you just want people to use your code, and if they're giving it back, great. If they're not, then, you know, okay, that's a shame. Um, I think in the hardware world, as um, I think we've discussed that, um, I guess, multiple org comps now, there are, you know, have historically been lots of issues about exactly where the boundaries lie. Um, the CERN Open Hardware License is kind of taking that, um, trying to take that head on. Uh, so. For, I mean, for, uh, for, for me and for the, the stance Lois has taken, it's just that um, uh, whatever the merits may be of copyleft, um, there are disadvantages and they don't seem to outweigh, uh, I guess the merits don't seem to outweigh the benefits of just sticking with something which is uh, straightforward and simple. I, 
I, I can say something short. Uh, we love GPL um, and copyleft as a concept. Uh, and we are extremely excited uh, with the fact that CERN took up the very hard task of translating copyleft principles to the domain of hardware. And the reason why, uh, it's in particular, our community doing uh, open science hardware and, and, and working in academia is that it translates really well the ethics of academic research of being given so much uh, in terms of knowledge uh, from people who came before us, it makes sense that we also contribute back to these commons. So because it translates well into what we do in academia, uh, it, we want to see that happening also in the space of hardware. And we, of course, we understand that it's extremely complicated and we have, we interface with companies and we have other dynamics that are not only academic, uh, but uh, I don't think we sh I think it's a bit, uh, I would say, misleading to follow this idea that copyleft is detrimental to hardware or to the open hardware community in general. So that question goes to Anton now. Um, well, it's totally understandable, kind of the Cadence Academic Program wanting to protect their uh, commercial business. But then on the other hand, it's very, very hard for hobbyists or even smaller companies to get access to a paid commercial Cadence tool. If you ever try to access the Cadence webshop, you're not gonna find a simulator there. Um, at least I don't think so. Um, so are there efforts to actually make it easier to make those tools on a paid basis, of course, but make them at least accessible in a more reasonable form for uh, small entities? Uh, well, so um, so uh, what we what we currently have uh, is a pro is a program for uh, for startups. Uh, so we call it a proof of concept uh, program. So the idea here is that uh, um, a startup uh, usually f uh, first has to um, get some investments, and in order to get investments, so then uh, they have to show a proof of concept that their idea is uh, is working. But in order to uh, uh, show a proof of concept, so they have to, uh, they need access to licenses, and then they uh, they have to uh, create this uh, uh, so the circuit or this this, this design. And uh, so here we uh, we have a, we have a program so that uh, a startup can get access to uh, uh, to uh, productive licenses uh, for uh, for one year. They can do one MPW. And uh, they, are, they have basically very similar restrictions as a uh, university software program. So they, they cannot uh, sell the prototype, uh, they cannot uh, um, license it. So they uh, can just demonstrate it uh, through the potential investors, through potential customers. And uh, then when they um, have collected the investments, so then uh, they get transformed into a, a commercial company and then they uh, get access to the uh, productive license of Cadence. So this is uh, uh, this is something that we have set up for uh, startups. Um, so regarding um, uh, hobbyists, um, so here um, I I don't I don't have a, a good answer for that. Uh, so the the only um, thing what we are currently also working on is um, to make uh, our uh, Orchid uh, software so for PCB uh, more accessible for uh, uh, for stu for students um, so that they don't have to be at the university, but they can also use uh, um, our, our software at, ho at home as well. Yeah, I have a question for Tim. Um, so have you given any thought to um, the issue of where does hardware, a hardware design begin and where does the software stop? Uh, so uh, when, you, um, when you have software that generates hardware, a hardware design, for example, Right. Uh, I don't. I don't know. For example, if um, if you can assimilate a script that generates hardware uh, to a VHDL file that has generics, and when you when the user instantiates and gives a given value to a generic, uh, the uh, the resulting hardware can be very different. Yet nobody would challenge that the, that VHDL is is part of the hardware design, uh, but that same task can actually be performed by software. Uh, and um, I was wondering if, if you have given any thought to uh, where where to draw the line, because I think it could have implications for the licensing. You know, wh where, where do you start licensing the hardware design and, and stop licensing the software? Uh, I don't know if your question is clear enough. Uh, yeah, well, I, th I think the answer to that is no, we haven't given it 
a huge amount of thought. Uh, our goal for licensing is really to leave it to the users to decide how they want it to be licensed. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of passing the buck, right? We're, <laughs> we're saying it's not our problem, it's your problem. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's something that needs attending to. And I really can't give you a much more firm answer than that. Sorry. I have another question for you that came to my mind during your talk. I was wondering, like, do you, so you differentiate between proprietary and open, right? But there's like stuff like the Open Chain Project, SPDX, and the others, like, do you track compatibilities between licenses? Do you even track the open source license attached to something? Do you do sanity checks or something like this? That's something that I would like to have pretty much automated, except that right now we have not been dealing with enough IP to uh, make that necessary. It's all you know, just something that we do ourselves. You know, we'll, we'll check to see whether the IP is compatible or not. Um, but I can see that, you know, it, it is something that should be true, that you select the license that you want, and then when you go to create IP, that all that will be taken care of automatically by scripts. It will see, are you using IP? Is this incompatible? Um, yeah, if, if your licenses are, are well defined, then all that should be automatic. Michael. Oh, you have to. Sorry. You can also proxy it. Somebody else can throw it further, but it's not like insanely efficient. This is fun. I like this. Um, so I've been to uh, a few of these conferences over the last few years. This, well, this is the first wash, but I've been to AllConf, and we've had similar panel discussions about hardware licensing. There was something at FOSDEM earlier this year. Um, so I just I have a question for the panel. I mean, how 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 much longer do you think we have to keep talking about this? I mean, we have. We have solder pad. There's commercial uh, designs that are using cores that are licensed under that. Uh, we had, you know, a pretty successful uh, Risk Five workshop where lots of people announced stuff. Some of which was open source. I mean, what do you see are the big issues? Um, you know, why why are we still having panel discussions about open hardware licensing? And you know, what do you think needs to be solved? How far along the road are we? I ask these people to come here and talk about it, and we are trying to license our things, and we um, we still there's still open issues. So this is why I mean maybe there are not so many people in the room here. It's being recorded, so that's that's something nice. But I think one of the main discussions started uh, when was it? Orconf in Geneva. It's I think yeah. one of the best references to using GPL in hardware. Yes or no? For example, it's. It started the thing. There needs to be some talk still. There has not been any litigation. It's not very clear what's going to happen. And, um, you know, I was in the process of deciding using solder pad for ETH Zurich. Uh, we released it under this license. So is this the best license? Did we do something wrong? Is there something better? And what's the difference between OHLP and solder pad? version XY and Apache. Why should I use one over the other one? I am completely unable to answer the question. So my hope is I bring all the experts here and I can have a chat with them over lunch or the sandwiches outside or in this forum to learn more about it so I can make better informed decisions. I'm sorry for bothering. <laughs> but you're still coming, right? So. <laughs> so, just to compliment uh, what Frank said, um, this thing, I, I think the, the unsolved problem is reciprocal licensing, I think. It, this is the big thing that is unsolved. Some people have a reciprocal mindset. They need, they want to use a reciprocal license of some kind, weak or strong. And uh, I think this started, as, as he said, in Orconf. I gave a talk about how I interpreted GPL and LGPL for hardware designs. And then there was a very interesting uh, Q&A session after the talk where mainly I think it was a risk five people. They asked a number of very interesting questions that made me think by the, by the end of that talk that it was not at all clear that GPL and LGPL were appropriate licenses for, for HCL. And that's when we started working on, on, on something that could fill that gap. Some people want to have reciprocal licensing for hardware. I think that's the main challenge. Um, yeah. 
Well, I have an, one more question about the, again, copyleft, um, which is, you know, when you want to promote copyleft uh, in academia, um, and this is a question mainly for academics, don't you think there is maybe a conflict of interest at the moment that companies like maybe Google or other big tech, which don't like notoriously copyleft, start financing PhDs and start financing projects? So do you see any conflict of interest at that point? Or should this happen a little bit more independently, maybe with public funding from the EU or, or other sources? Anybody has some thoughts about that? preceded uh, the, the graduate program. I also, so I don't really Please. see the problem there because like in the end it's open source, right? It's not like the paying company keeps the PhD student away from publishing it. It just tells the student to put it on a permissive license, not on a copyleft license. So I don't really see the contractual agreement between the society, the PhD student and the big tech company, why copyleft should be superior to permissive in that case. To be honest, like this is just my, maybe you can elaborate on, on why you think it is uh, better, but, um, but yeah, there's code produced, there's code on the internet, people can use it and there's virtually no restriction on how to use it. Like what do you want more, right? I, so that said, I, I understand, I, I, I also prefer copyleft, but uh, that's, that's how it goes, right? I mean, if I may say something, for me, copyleft is um, the more restrictive license. Uh, copyleft is you don't want to give everything away. Copyleft is you say, okay, I'm giving this, but under only the condition that whatever you do, it stays the way I made it and nothing is, I mean, you know, it stays the way I intended it. Copyright is like, you know, this is it, take it, do it, whatever you want, just keep my name on it. And... Um, it's also, I mean, we, we had it as ETH, for example, or as the, Luca is also from ETH, so it's not right to say ETH. So as the uh, Digital uh, Services and Systems Group of Professor Luca Benini working on the PAL project, uh, when you uh, give it away and people don't tell that they are using, for example, your cores in their projects, um, I mean, at the beginning you're saying they're using it, but nobody's telling us. You get used to it after a while. You get happy when you hear about it, but you don't get really upset after a while. I, I, I don't know, but we had to also learn working with it. I think there's a question. So I, I think this is always a, this uh, discussion between copyleft and permissive licenses, but I think there's a thing in between uh, where what you really want is to have improvements made to the uh, project you're working on. You want to have that back. You don't care about the other things around it. And I actually do think we should call these copyback li licenses because that's basically what it is and we treat them as a separate category to avoid this infected question about uh, copyleft and permissive licenses. I think at last our conflict was kind of the conclusion that we just don't want to call it copyleft anymore because it's like, like all the stuff around MPL, right? So we want people to, um, to give back. We don't care about where they're integrated, right? They can do whatever they want. <laughs> well, since you asked to elaborate a bit on this, to me, actually, the permissive is what I call a temporarily open. So it's basically a permissive is something that tomorrow can be closed again, which is the entire point why Google and other companies don't like at all copyleft. It's like evil for them. They cannot touch it, they burn, they, they disappear if they were touching this. And that's the entire point of having it open. So it seems a bit the hypocrisy calling it something open source, which is actually temporarily open source, and tomorrow somebody can close it again. We think about the BSD kernel, when taken by iOS, you know, this is not anymore a mainstream kernel. Uh, what's, what's a mainstream is GPL Linux, which is in 80% of Androids, is one of the most used software on the planet, and that's what we're looking for. So the entire idea of calling open something which is permissive finally and temporarily open because somebody wants to close it again, that's to be a bit of a contradiction. And so if you really want to cooperate with companies who do those tricks, well, 
is this really good also for the community of those bit more idealistic people, makers and others, which I think you're addressing as well with this conference, that actually want to contribute to the community and not to contribute to iOS and make it close tomorrow. So this was a bit of elaboration on it. I think, I think that's a really good point. Um, and you know, something that um, I quite often say to people is, um, you know, the statistics that say something like Mac OS is 70% you know, open source. No, it's not. It's 70% stuff that used to be open source. And that, that is a really important distinction to make. Lunch. So who's hungry? <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists, thanks to the speakers. It was a great session, I think. <clears throat>